we uh, continue Joshua tonight, um, we're going to do chapters 3 and 4, but um, I'm going to read chapter 3 first and then pontificate upon that, and then we'll move on and read chapter 4. So we'll start by reading chapter 3 together. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, who are Levites, carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark, and do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you, as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is in flood or during harvest, Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And uh, when we shortly read chapter 4, well, actually discovered that it's uh, recounting the same facts, but adding in one or two other details that aren't in chapter three. So basically, chapter three and four are two, you know, two accounts of the crossing of the Jordan, but each one giving a slightly different, um, you know, sort of detail. So chapter four fills in one or two details that chapter three doesn't. But um, anyway, chapter three, the the one that we've we've read first. And uh, there are basically two things uh, of major interest to, to home in on here. And uh, the, the first one is to see, as the, I mean, the whole nation are going to be walking you know, across the Jordan and you know, the Lord does this miracle rather like he did at the Red Sea 40 years earlier and the water's piling up and they go over on dry ground. But um, the particular thing I want us to notice at the moment was the fact that the priests went in first carrying the ark. Uh, We'll just read verses um, 2 and 3 again. Um, 
After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then in verse 14, when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. And then in verse 17, um, it says, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood on firm, dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed over. And uh, so what you've got here is the fact that the, the priests carry the Ark in front of the people, right? Uh, they step down into the water, and also there's one representative from each tribe, and we'll be looking at that more in chapter 4. And as, as the priests touch the wall, it parts, and then the priests carry the ark, and they stand in the centre, and then when everyone is over, the priests come out, and then the waters start flowing again. So we can see the absolute centrality here of the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, what it represents was this ark was the symbol of the presence of God amongst them. Uh, you know, sort of like, um, you know, I mean, at this, at this stage, the ark was the nearest thing the Lord had to live in. You know, I mean, there was the tabernacle that they were carrying around. But the ark, you know, which was like the centre of their worship, really represented the presence of, of God with them. And of course, this, this, this ark was... was a throne. Its, its design was such that it was like a throne. But on top of the throne you had the lid, and that was where the mercy seat was. And of course all this pictures the fact that it, it was, you know, sort of, I mean, Jesus is king, and yet he is also the mercy seat. You know, the king of the universe is also the one who's provided forgiveness for us. Uh, for us. So it's a picture of the blessing of God being amongst his people. But by virtue of it being a throne, it represents kingly authority. And so we see a tie-up here, that as far as the ark was concerned, symbolising the presence of God amongst his people Israel, the thing that represented that was also the thing that represented God's authority. It was a throne. And so what we see is the blessing of the presence of God is synonymous with the blessing of his authority. And that what we need to see here is that whenever the Lord is present amongst his people, he is present amongst his people as king. So if the Lord is here, which he is, he is here as Lord can you see? There is no such thing in the Bible as envisaging the Lord just being present. The Lord is present as Lord. He is the King of the whole earth. And if, if you go over to Matthew 18, and just to read some words of Jesus, this is something that we're tremendously familiar with, but nevertheless it ties in here. If you find Matthew 18... And in verse 20, and um, and Jesus says, Again I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Now, that's the promise of Jesus, that whenever his people gather in his name, he is there amongst them. There is the presence of God amongst his people. But the important thing to realise is that Jesus says that when two or three of his people gather together in his name, and that's the important thing, because of course in his name, what is Jesus' name? He's been given the name that is above every name, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. In his name represents his authority. I mean, a policeman will arrest you in the name of the law. 
Now then, not anyone can just arrest you for anything, even a policeman. A policeman can't just decide to arrest you for anything. He's got to arrest you in the name of the law. He's got to be doing so as a representative of the authority of the law. And so therefore, in the name of the law, represents the authority of the law over us. We are the subjects of the laws of the land. Now, in exactly the same way, to gather together in the name of Jesus, to know his presence amongst us, is to come together knowing that we do so under the authority of his name, because he is Lord. And so in exactly the same way that amongst Israel, the ark which represented the presence of God amongst his people was designed as a throne. The throne represented the authority of God over his people. Now, in the same way, we are the people of Jesus. He is here amongst us. But he's here amongst us because we gather together in his name. So his presence is linked with his authority over us. And this is the important thing all the time to realise. And in fact, the context of this bit that we've just read from Matthew, um, in the verses preceding, um, the context is discipline within the church. Let's just read the immediate context. Start at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he won't listen, take one or two others, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And even if he refuses to listen to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And there you've got excommunication or putting someone out of fellowship because of unrepentant sin. The very context in which Jesus says, where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. The context is discipline within the church. It's authority. Because if we gather together, and if Jesus is here, he is here as Lord, and we as his people are to be under his authority. So the presence of God equals the authority of God. And uh, often it's so easy, you know, to sort of, to get the impression, I mean, certainly the Lord wants to bless us. Of course he does. He loves us. He just, he's just bursting with love for us. He wants to bless us. But it is not true to say, and we often act like this, as if the Lord is here for us. You know, the kind of, you know, you particularly get it, you know, sort of like in so much of Christianity today, the idea that the Lord is here for us. You know, I mean, so much evangelism makes its appeal on come to Jesus, he'll do this for you, he'll do that for you. And this idea that God is here for us. Well, it's not so much that God is here for us. We are here for him. That is the correct way. And evangelism ought to be preaching the fact that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Not, you know, we invite you to come to Jesus because of all the benefits he's going to give you, almost as if Jesus is our servant. No. The appeal of evangelism is the command that men submit to the authority of God, repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All the time it should be response to the authority of God. He is, after all, God. He's not our butler. And it is so easy you know, to make the transition, isn't it? Almost from things like, you know, my car, my home, my hi-fi, my wife, my children, my God. You see, almost as if, you know, my God, in some kind of possessive sense, as if God is here for us. No, we are here from him. We, for him, he is the creator. We are the, the creatures. And our place is always to be submissive and in obedience to him. His love? Yeah, all the time. I mean, he's not some despot or anything like that. He wants to bless us. But the important thing to realise is that the presence of God is a throne. It's the representation of his authority over us. And again in verse, nine to, uh, verse um, um, 19, when uh, you know it says, I tell you if two or uh, two of you agree on earth about anything, 
Um, the context of that, I mean, often you get this faith teaching, don't you? This idea that, you know, sort of like, if, if you have faith for something, if you believe something, if you confess something, then because you're doing it in faith, and because God responds to faith, that somehow God is bound to, you know, he must respond to your faith. And, you know, almost this, this picture, you know, of God almost being like, you know, a divine cigarette machine, and you put the money in, it's your faith, you believe, and then you pull the drawer out and you get your cigarettes out of the bottom or whatever it is. Again, the context here is all the time in my name. So the point is we can be absolutely assured that God is going to answer our prayers when our prayers are prayed in accordance with his will. But any idea, as various teachings in the charismatic movement today might suggest, that if you have faith, God has got to do something. What we've got to realise, God has not got to do anything. God does what he chooses to do. God is not our debtor. He's not beholding to us in any way at all. He has given himself to us because of his love. But all the time we need to realise that our relationship with him is all the time bowing down in submission to him. All right. And uh, we've got to make sure, because, I mean, today, this thing in the name of Jesus, Christians, it's easy to start using it as if it's some kind of incantation. There's something you really want, so if you confess it or if you pray it, if you add in the name of Jesus, this somehow guarantees that God's going to do it. That's magic. That, that, that is the exact opposite to the teaching of the Bible. When we pray in his name, what we're saying, to pray in the name of Jesus is the equivalent of praying, of, of like with every prayer, as it were, ending it, saying, but Lord, not my will, but yours be done. That is what it is to pray and to live in the name of Jesus. And we see it in Joshua symbolised by the fact that the presence of God amongst his people was a throne. And the throne represented his authority over his people. Now, one of the things we're seeing in Joshua is the parallel between the Canaanites that they had to move out of the land and defeat and the principalities and powers, Satan and the demons, that we're involved with in spiritual warfare. And uh, you'll notice in verse 3 the continuing emphasis that God was the God of the whole earth. Now the point was that Israel was moving into Canaan knowing that the Lord was going to move the Canaanites out. Now why was God going to move the Canaanites out? Because he was the king of all the earth. God was over the Canaanites as well. All right. But the point is, if we are to expect in any way at all, as we should, that we're going to see the victory of God over Satan in our lives, that's going to happen because Satan is under God. God is over Satan. Then we've got to realise as well that the authority that God has over Satan is also the same as the authority God has over us. I.e. the point is... Israel was not going into the promised land saying, as it were, well, our God is over you, therefore shove off, but we can do what we like. The point was that God got rid of the Canaanites through Israel who were living under his authority at the time. Or to put it another way, any authority that we have over Satan, practically in our lives, is going to be to the extent that we are under the authority of the Lord himself. So the point is, God's presence is a throne. That means that Satan is under his feet. But that also means that we are to live in submission to Jesus. And only to that extent is Satan going to be under our feet as well. So therefore, the kingship of God over Satan is the same of his kingship over us. So we must never think in any way at all, you know, that just because we're Christians that we have some kind of magic power, be it over the devil or anyone or anything else. We don't. But we can exert the authority of God over Satan to the extent that we ourselves are living under the authority of God. So then, the ark of the Lord, the symbol of God's presence amongst Israel, was also the symbol of throne of his authority over them. 
and that's got to be the same with us as well. Now, the second thing that I want us to, to notice here in um, chapter 3 is, 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 is something that only by sort of digging around in ancient history you'd actually find out. It's not self-evident um, in the scripture itself. And it's the significance of the fact that Israel are crossing the Jordan in a miraculous way. It's the significance that this is a repeat performance of a miracle that involved water. Forty years earlier, Israel had miraculously crossed the Red Sea. Now they are miraculously crossing the Jordan. And there's great significance there in regards to the fact that the Canaanites, all right, the peoples in the land they were moving into, their chief deity the, the, the major idol that the Canaanites worshipped was an idol called Baal. Now, we know that behind Baal, behind every idol, is Satan and demons. But the point is, every idol, every false god, although Satan and the demons are behind it, each false god is invested with his own history, his own mythology, etc., etc. Now, the reason that the Canaanites worshipped this particular idol called Baal is that uh, they believed that he had defeated the sea god in battle. So therefore the Canaanites, in their worship of Baal, they elevated him to be their chief deity, their chief idol, because they believed that, I mean in times past, that Baal had, uh, you know, kind of beaten uh, the god that up till that point was the strongest of the lot, and it was the sea god. So Baal became idol number one in Canaan because he'd beaten up a sea god. Now, here, all right, what's happening? Look, the Lord God, the one true God, the only God, now works incredible water miracle number two. Now, can you see the symbolism here? Baal was number one in the Canaanites' eyes because he prevailed over all things watery, as it were. He'd beaten the sea god. Now, here come Israel with their god working these incredible miracles across the Red Sea and now the River Jordan. And do you remember, we saw that when the spies had gone into Jericho, Rahab told them that all the inhabitants of the land had been absolutely terrified of Israel right back from the crossing of the Red Sea 40 years earlier. And now you see one of the major reasons. They all worshipped an idol who had beaten the sea god. Now along comes Israel with a god who is clearly even more powerful than Baal. And this is one of the reasons why the Canaanites were in such disarray and in fear of um, Israel. So can you see the significance that as, as God leads his people ever towards Canaan in order to kick out the Canaanites and possess the land. God is doing so in such a way that he's, before the battles even start, God is making a mockery of their number one God that they're going to be depending on. So Israel's going to go in there depending on the Lord their God, the one true God. The Canaanites are going to fight back depending primarily on Baal. But why Baal? Well, because he beat the sea god. Can you see? They were demoralised from the word go. So the Lord is kind of, he's, he's, he's kind of beating the Canaanites even on their own terms, as it were. But also there's uh, something more as well. Because um, the Canaanites, uh, you know, sort of that ha had some quite strange legal, you know, sort of systems and stuff like that. I mean, that they were very perverted people and uh, a very strange idea of justice. And because of Baal, you know, being, ha having beaten, you know, like the sea god, I mean, water actually played quite a big part in their ceremonial and religious lives. And uh, they, they actually had um, kind of a way of settling certain legal court cases uh, by a trial by water. Now, it was actually very similar to, um, you know, the witch hunts in this country. Do you remember what they used to do? Get a witch, and they used to have the ducking stalls, didn't they? 
and they, they ducked you underwater. And basically, if you died, you were a witch. Um, no, sorry, if you died, you weren't a witch. If you survived, you were. And so they burnt you at the stake. I mean, that's, that's really bad odds, isn't it? Um, but, but the Canaanites actually had an ordeal by water that was uh, very similar to that. And fundamentally, it boiled down, if they were trying to establish if you were guilty or innocent, then basically if you drowned, you were innocent. And if you survived, you were guilty. And uh, so what you've got here is that the Canaanites actually decided issues of right or wrong, in some instances, with the use of water. Now, what you've got here is the Lord, all right? Because Israel, okay, they, 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 they pass through firstly the Red Sea, and now the Jordan, in a miraculous way that clearly they survived, but they survived that clearly they were innocent, as it were, that it was clearly revealed that the one true God was backing them all the way. And so in a kind of ironic twist, God is demonstrating to the Canaanites by a trial by water, all right, that, that this invading army of Israel who are going to come and be God's judgment on Canaanites and, and kill them and run them out of the land, God is showing by an ordeal by water that they are the innocent ones and that in actual fact it's the Canaanites who are guilty because up until some years previous Canaan belonged to the Canaanites and God was quite happy with that. But they had become so depraved over the years and the generations, they had become so evil and wicked in God's sight that God pronounced that his judgment on them would be that they would be driven out of the land and be replaced by a people who would honour the Lord a bit more, i.e. Israel. And so this coming across the Red Sea and then coming across the Jordan there's a sense in which God is proclaiming to the Canaanites, sort of, I'm the one true God and I'm coming. Don't bother about Baal. He beat the sea god, but look what I've done to the Red Sea and the Jordan. Forget Baal. Oh, and by the way, you're guilty. Can you see? All this is, is being... Sp the, the Canaanites would have understood all this. It was the symbolism was speaking their language. And so you can see how, you know, sort of like why they were terrified of Israel right back from the crossing of the Red Sea. And you can see the Lord stamping his claim of ownership on Canaan. Because after all, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Again, remember chapter 3, all this emphasis on the Lord of the whole earth. Everything belongs to God. All right. I mean, the Canaanites believed that there were gods of this, that, and the other. There'd be a hill god and a valley god and a sea god and a land god. Well, God is saying there's only one god, and he owns the whole caboodle. And so, therefore, this is God stamping his claim of ownership of the land and saying, right, I consider you now to be guilty. I'm going to destroy you, and I'm going to bring another people in to take your place. And so, what God is doing, he's actually telling the Canaanites what he's going to do on the basis of their own beliefs. And that's the remarkable thing about it. God is speaking, as it were, to the Canaanites in their own language. So he's communicating them, uh, as it were, almost on the basis of their very own beliefs. And uh, then just one, one last thing here in uh, chapter 3, and uh, in, in, in verse 7 and this is to do more with Joshua personally. Uh, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. And of course, what you have here is the beginning of the Lord vindicating the leadership and authority of Joshua. We saw in an earlier study, didn't we, when we did chapter 1, we saw a particular order. We saw that God spoke to Joshua, then Joshua spoke to the people, and then the people responded to Joshua. And that's the order, all right? But what the people basically said to Joshua is that we will submit to you, we will follow you as our leader, only may the Lord be with you as he was with Moses. 
So what they were saying, they weren't giving uh, Joshua unconditional submission in any sense of the word, but what they were saying, to the extent that we can clearly see that God is with you, we're going to follow, all right? And that's tremendously important, you know. And that, 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 that here, what's happening is that God says to Joshua, right now, I'm, I'm going to start vindicating you and the people are going to really be seeing that I am with you as I was with Moses. Remember, Moses led them across the Red Sea. Now Joshua is going to do the same in regards to, um, to the river Jordan. And, um, and of course, this is important because the people here are going to see ultimately with Joshua, not just words, but they're going to see him in action. They're going to start getting the ongoing proof that God is with him. And of course the point is, in regards to leaders, whoever they may be, is that if you believe, all right, that particular people, that you know, that you acknowledge particular people to be leaders, that decision has got to be made almost in an instant of time. One's got to say, right, I am happy that I, you know, I recognise such and such as being a man of God and a leader over me. And that decision is made in a moment of time. But what's important is that that decision, you have to keep remaking it in the light of clearly seeing that the Lord is with that man or those men in an ongoing way i.e. it's not the point that you decide I acknowledge that this person to be a leader of God over me and that's it, it's written in stone because after all, that may be true of someone now but give it a few years, they may go well off course they may backslide, they may you know, get all kinds of things in their life which are wrong and stuff like that so the point is you've got to keep looking for that on go- you've got to be satisfied not just that God was with that person but that the Lord is still with them in an ongoing way and that you've got to, to be satisfied of the ongoing developing fruit in their own lives. So, you know, it's not just, you know, here that the people said, right, Joshua, uh, we believe God's with you, that's it. We will now, from this moment, unerringly keep following you. What the Lord says to Joshua is, I'm going to give the people the ongoing evidence that I'm with you because that's, that's important. It's an ongoing way. You've got to see that your leaders are growing in the Lord and growing in the fruit of the Spirit as well. Uh, that's, that's tremendously important. Otherwise, how, how can they have your trust? Not that you've got to see that leaders are perfect and that, that I mean, you know, that they don't fall flat on their face. They do like anyone else. But you know what I mean. You've got to be satisfied in an ongoing way that the Lord is with any men that you um, accept and look up to as leaders. Right, okay, let's uh, now move on to uh, chapter 4. And um, this is basically a retelling of the events of chapter 3, but it just um, adds a couple of details. Right, when the whole nation have finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So what they're doing is they're taking stones from the centre and setting them up on the side where they crossed over as a memorial. So it would always be there. So when people said, oh, what are those stones, Daddy? You know, you could say to the kids exactly what happened. It was like teaching aids. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. 
Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the Ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, armed, in front of the Israelites, as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they revered him all the days of his life, just as they had revered Moses, because they could see that the Lord really was. It wasn't just talk, that, 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 that Joshua was actually living out his, his calling. Uh, then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Testimony to come out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran in flood as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal, on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their father, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know, i.e. the Can Canaanites, that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you, i.e. the Lord's people, might always fear the Lord your God. Right, so we've got one or two other details there. The first bit of detail we've got is that in this, the crossing over, when the waters parted, uh, parted and the priests were in the middle, the first people over are Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh. Now that should ring bells, all right. You remember we saw this in an earlier talk. Way back when, when Israel first kind of like, you know, sort of came through the wilderness and got a glimpse of the promised land, right back in Moses' time, 40 years earlier, you remember that the men of Reuben and Gad and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they saw that the land, the other side of the Jordan, so not quite into Canaan, they saw that that land was so nice that they said to Moses, look, can we, can we have this land? You know, rather than going into Canaan, it's so nice here, can we set up shop here? It's great. And you remember what Moses said to them. He said, well, look, the great difficulty is that uh, the other tribes, they're going to have to go in and fight for, you know, for theirs, but you, you're going to get yours without fighting. So therefore, what he was saying is, we've got to know that you're not just trying to get out of your responsibility. We've got to make sure you're not on the sky here. So therefore, he says, you can have that land outside of Canaan, but when we go into Canaan, you've got to go in, and only when all the other tribes have got their land in Canaan, then can you go back across the Jordan and settle your land. And that was the agreement. They said, yeah, no problem at all. Because they weren't trying to skive, they weren't trying to get out of fighting, they just liked that land. And so therefore, we, we saw that, that Reuben and Gad and half Manasseh kind of represented everyone pulling their weight. You know, that, 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 that all Christians are involved in spiritual warfare. All Christians have got to be involved in, in being submissive to the Lord and overcoming the evil one. And so therefore, Reuben, Gad and half Manasseh represent everyone pulling their weight. And of course, it's significant here that they are the first over. You know, that they're really going out of their way. They're saying, look, you know, we're going to, you know, we're not skiving. We understand that our original suggestion may have made you think we might have been, but we weren't, and oh boy, we're going to prove it. And so Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh, they were kind of first in. All the battles, bang, they were there, out front leading. And so that's tremendously important. They were laying to rest any fears that the rest of Israel might have 
that them wanting to settle the land in, you know, sort of like before Jordan, they had to, to really calm everyone's fears that it wasn't that they were trying to skive, it was just honestly that they liked that land. And they were quite happy to do all the fighting for the rest of Israel as surely as if they themselves were going to settle actually in Canaan. Now the other thing that uh, we're really going to home in on now, and this, this will basically be it for tonight, this is the, the, the main thing out of um, chapter 4 that I want to home in on, is the thing about these 12 stones from the riverbed uh, that um, what uh, Joshua has them do is that as they're going across, uh, one, one person from each tribe of Israel you're remembering chapter 3, he appointed them so that when the priest stepped in to the river with the ark and the waters parted, there was one representative from each tribe who stepped in with them. Now that the waters are parted, all right, as they're going across, these 12 men, one from each tribe, are told to each take a stone from the riverbed in the middle and to take it over with them so that with these 12 stones they can build a memorial the other side. And of course that will act as a memorial, you know, so that, that it will always be there to remind Israel what God had done uh, for them in going across the Jordan. Now obviously, the significance of this, I mean you've got 12 stones, one for each tribe, you've got the 12 tribes of Israel here. And of course, what you've got here is the fact that God's people Israel were a corporate people. They were 12, 12 individual tribes that made up the whole people. And of course, in that corporateness, we have in Israel a picture of the church. We have there a picture of fellowship. And of course, the emphasis and the symbolism here is that whereas, of course, we individually follow the Lord, we all as Christians have an individual relationship with Jesus. And no one must ever take that from us. That is sacrosanct, of course. We came to the Lord on our own, naked, like a baby. We brought nothing and no one with us. That was us and the Lord, all right? And that never changes. But the Lord has made us in such a way that though we are individuals, we've been made so that we relate to other individuals around us as well. And within the church, what God wants us to do is to live out our individual lives before the Lord in relationship to other believers who are doing the same thing. To be part of a church. To be part of a group of other believers. I.e., it's another way of saying, as a Christian, none of us can go it alone. Uh, I think I've said before that probably the you know, sort of like next to someone actually being born again and baptised with the Spirit, the second most important thing in their lives is becoming part of a biblical church, being part of the corporate body of Christ. And obviously there's a sense in which the church exists as uh, all believers. So, so the church universal, as it were, uh, consists not just of us here, but every other believer who's alive on the face of the earth at the moment, every believer throughout history right back to Pentecost and indeed every believer who hasn't even been born or born again yet that's the church universal all right but the Lord breaks us down into smaller units and it's the unit of the local church i.e. the you know the particular group of believers that the Lord places you amongst as an individual church and this is tremendously, it's vitally important that we don't live out our Christian lives purely individually. The 12 tribes of Israel, we belong with other believers. There's no going it alone. And, um, you know, this is sort of like very much revision here, but I just want to, you know, sort of go over the heart of what church and fellowship is actually about. What does it mean to be part of a church? What does is this fellowship that we're supposed to be having with each other. And uh, the actual Greek word that, that, that gets translated church um, is made up of two smaller Greek words. One is ek, which means out of, 
and the other is klesia, which means to call. And, um, and it literally means called out of. That's what the word church means, called out of. Um, the equivalent Hebrew word in the Old Testament is kwahau, and that's from a root word which means to summon. And it's used as an assembly or a congregation of people. And that what it boils down to is that a church is a group of people who have been called together by God, summoned together by God to hear and to do his will. We're back to the Ark of the Covenant, we're back to that throne. We're called into the presence of God together to hear and to do his will. Remember, God isn't there for us, primarily we are there for him. And so to be part of a church is to, as an individual who's been called to follow the Lord, you are also called to be part of a, a group of other believers who individually have been called to follow the Lord, so that you come together and follow him together in partnership or in fellowship. So, what's, what's fellowship? What's that in the Greek? The Greek word for fellowship, koinonia, and it means an association or a partnership. That's its broadest meaning, an association or a partnership. In its verb form, which is koinonia, it means to share or to have a share in. But it's slightly more than that in the Greek. And the best way to hold, to, to, you know, to get a hold of it is to see what its opposite is. And the opposite word to koinonia in the Greek is pleonexia, which means to grasp, to be acquisitive, and it means to, to get what you can out of something. Now that is its opposite meaning. So what you've got is this. With koinonia, with fellowship, that when we're called together as a church, this group of people who together are going to follow the Lord, the basis of that partnership that we have with each other is not an equal basis at all. What it is, is if I am to have fellowship with other people who are following the Lord, the emphasis on the fellowship that I'm called to have is not a partnership in the sense of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. That's a partnership, isn't it? You do your bit, I'll do my bit. You chuck your bit in, I'll chuck my bit in. That would be a partnership. But in the Greek, what this is, the emphasis is not what I take out of the common pool. The emphasis is on what I put into it. So in me being in fellowship in a church, what is incumbent upon me is to be concerned with primarily not what I'm going to get out of that group of people. My concern is what I can put into the group of people. My concern is not what I receive. My concern is what I can contribute. It's what I can give. And of course, that is the very nature of God. God's concern is not what he can get. I mean... Why should God be concerned with getting everything is his anyway? I mean, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you've got everything, there's nothing to get, is there? God is not on the take, because he's already got it all. Therefore, as we reflect the nature of the Lord, in our fellowship with other people, our concern is not so much to receive, but to give. Now then, of course, we will receive. And indeed, the more you give, the more you'll get. And I know that all of us have experienced that when our fellowship is selfish, purely wanting to get, we actually end up with very little. But when our fellowship is that we're concentrating on what we can give, then we find that we've come away having received a great deal. That's the way it is. If you want to receive, give. That's the order in which we work. And so this corporateness is that each one of us is called to be part of a group of other believers who are following the Lord, that we can be in partnership with them, growing together with them, 
living out our relationship with God by living it out with each other, but the emphasis is on what we can put in to the pot, as it were, not just what we can take out. Now, I want to actually um, show you a, a really excellent illustration of this from earlier on in uh, Joshua's life. And if you find Exodus 17, uh, we saw this uh, little story in our first talk, uh, the introduction to Joshua. I said then we'd be back to it, and uh, we're back to it now. Exodus chapter 17, you'll remember it when we read it. It's such, um, such a lovely picture here. And of course, within the context, as you're going to see of warfare, spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is a corporate thing. It's not something you just do as it were on your own. Right, let's read Exodus 17 and we'll read from verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now then, let's, th 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 there's so much in, in that, you know, sort of story there. It's warfare. The Amalekites attack God's people. Satan will always be on the attack against the church. Be it the church in general at large or be it individual churches, all right? Satan is always attacking the work of God. So we've got warfare, all right? And uh, th there, you cannot be a loner in the kingdom of God when it comes to spiritual warfare. Because if you are, I mean, th there can be very exceptional cases when people end up on their own because God has put them there. I mean, you know, sort of like people in prison for their faith, in solitary confinement, uh, you know, sort of people in countries where maybe they're literally the only Christian in their town or in their area, all right? But normatively, all right, normatively, in regards to spiritual warfare, go it alone and Satan will take you out. It's as simple as that. You'll not make it. You know, you can't come up against Satan on your own. Uh, you know, we, we haven't been designed to do that. And so here we see the teamwork. You know, Moses goes up the hill and, uh, you know, and Joshua goes out to do the fighting and Moses is up there and Aaron and her. And this is a team effort. This is everyone doing their particular bit. And of course, within the body of Christ, you know, God apportions his gifts to each one. The Holy Spirit gives such and such one gift, such and such another gift. We've got it all come, all doing our bit, all bringing that contribution that God has given to um, each one of us. And, um, you know, so, so individuals are not a great threat to Satan if they're not in fellowship with other people. And uh, one of Satan's tactics, and this is, I don't know how many of you are, you know, sort of like as au fait, perhaps with, you know, Doctor Who as I am, but I, you know, a bit of an expert on the Daleks. If you study the history of the Daleks, you know, throughout the, you know, the various, you know, the years of runnings of, uh, you know, Doctor Who and that, you'll find that they, they, they always use the same tactic. And the tactic of the Daleks was always divide and conquer. This, this was always their tactic, divide and conquer. That was almost their battle cry, as it were. Now, Satan works in exactly the same way. Um, he will try and isolate you. Always try and isolate, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. Why? Because it is so much harder to win out against a church. You know, against the two or three gathered together in my name. They get individuals on their own who aren't in right fellowship with other people, then uh, it's, it's, it's so much easier 
uh, for Satan to do it. So we, we, we need to, to realise the danger of, of isolating ourselves from our brothers and sisters in any way. I mean, even down to missing too many meetings, you know, as we come together. And it's not to say that we can never, you know, I mean, obviously there are going to be times when other things come up, but as soon as we start withdrawing and not coming, not meeting together, as it says in Hebrews, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. And I mean, that, that's one of the wisest injunctions in the whole Bible, because if you do, believe me, Satan will get in and deception and you'll start to go a bit cold and you'll start compromising with sin and it's, it's, it's you know, the thin end of the wedge, all right. And uh, so what's, what's happening here is that Joshua's down doing the fighting, okay, but uh, Moses is up on the top of the hill and he's got his rod, okay. And what happens is that if he lifts the rod high over his head like that, then Joshua prevails over the Amalekites and Israel are winning. But when Moses let the rod down, the Amalekites win. Now this rod, all right, that Moses had, it represented the authority of faith. Uh, you'll remember when Moses came to the Red Sea, God said, look, you know, lift up the rod, and he lifted it up and the waters parted. And this, this kind of rod represents the authority of God and active faith in the Lord, trusting the Lord and being in obedience to him. So of course, when Moses is lifting his faith high, when he's looking to the Lord and trusting the Lord, well, Satan is defeated. But when he lets the rod down, when his faith wavers, when he gets, becomes weak and maybe takes his eyes off the Lord, Satan starts to get the upper hand. All right. So what happens now? Well, this is the lovely kind of picture here. Is that Aaron and her are there with him, all right? And what they do is that they realise that he's getting tired. So Moses is standing there, he's lifting the rod out, up all right, but he's kind of getting weary and the rod comes down and Amalek starts to prevail. So what Aaron and her do, see, and this is fellowship, they put a rock there for him to sit on. So now Moses can sit down. And you see, we know, I mean, we're told in Hebrews that in the... Um, in the wilderness years, the rock that followed them was Christ. And this is a picture that Moses finds a rest in Jesus. Because, of course, the thing about spiritual warfare, it's not that you're trying to get the victory. You've got the victory. Do you see? There's a rest that we enter into. God's already won. And so Moses, now he's able to sit down. He takes the what The rock is taking the weight of the burden, not Moses. Jesus said, come to me, my yoke is light and my burden, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's a picture there that Moses, he comes to that peace, that rest, that absolute sense of victory in Jesus. When it's no longer him, it's the Lord doing it. But he only comes to that place because Aaron and her are there. It's fellowship. And then, now he's sitting down, Aaron and her hold his arms up. So they're supporting him either side. So can you see, whatever it is in the Christian life, whether it's our own sanctification, the Lord bringing us into greater holiness and righteousness, or whether it's prevailing over Satan in regards to spiritual warfare, whatever it is, we are dependent on fellowship, other believers being there to bring us to that place. So maturity, finding that victory over sin, over self, it all comes through fellowship. And, uh, and it says here that his hands were steady till the going down of the sun. That was a long day that he had to hold that rod up, a very long day. But endurance depends on fellowship as well. So all these things, see how vital it is that we are in fellowship with other believers. We're only, I mean, we must grow in the Lord individually. We're not talking about losing our relationship with Jesus individually. But what we're saying is, I'm only going to keep growing in the Lord individually to the extent that I'm rightly related into fellowship in regards to whatever church God has led me to be part of. We're dependent on that fellowship. If you go to John 11, just a um, story from, uh, from the life of Jesus that illustrates this, this same thing. We've seen Moses being given a rock to sit on and being helped to 
hold his, you know, the rod over his head. And uh, John chapter 11, and this is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Uh, we'll start, start to read from verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour. He's been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. He's still got the grave clothes on. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, you've got to see the picture here, all right? This is a literal, you know, he's being raised from the dead. But take it now, symbolise it with me. It happened, it was a true story, but take the the symbolism of it. Here's someone who's been raised to newness of life. This is you and I being born again. All right? Right? New life in Christ. But old Lazarus, he's, he's like, literally like a mummy. He's wrapped hand to, 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 you know, head to toe. And he's kind of hobbling out, you know, a bit like a penguin. All right? He's alive. He's got the new life. He's been raised from the dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. So that life is there. But is he yet living that life to all its fullness? Well, no, because the stuff of his death, all the grave clothes, are still trapping him. And when we come to the Lord, we have the new life, but my goodness, the old life still traps us as well, all that death of the old life. And what Jesus said to the disciples, he said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And what Jesus is saying here, that you and I, okay, we've got new life. We're alive in Jesus. But like Lazarus, we're hobbling around like penguins. Because the grave clothes, even though we're alive, virtually keeping us as if we're still dead. So we need the grave clothes removed so that we can more and more actually experience the fullness of life that we've now got i.e. come into the holiness of the Lord but how does it happen? it happens by other believers taking the grave clothes off us bit by bit and we of course play a part in taking the grave clothes off of other Christians and can you see the picture here? it's only in fellowship that we really come into the fullness of the experience of the new life that Jesus has given to us and when you get Christians who tend to live a rather isolated Christian life, I mean, they may have loads of fellowship, they may spend lots of times with Christians, but they church hop, they hop here and they hop, never get involved anywhere too much. And they don't realise it, but they're, you know, they're not getting free of their grave clothes. You know, they think that they are, but they're not really, because it's only in meaningful, ongoing and deep fellowship that we really do begin to get free of the grave clothes and that we begin to experience what it is, what the Bible says, to put off the old man. And it was only here as the grave clothes were taken off him that he was able to really start living that life to the full. And that's the same with us. I'm only going to become all the time freer and freer of the grave clothes. Freer and freer of that old life of sin, putting off the old man, as Paul says. I'm only going to be able to do that to the extent that I'm in ongoing fellowship with my brothers and sisters. It's vitally important. You're not ever going to really grow in the Lord and be sanctified if you go it alone. And I'll just give you one very quick underlying reason 
in practical terms to show you why you're never going to do it on your own. And it's for this simple reason. In order to get any one great bit of grave clothes removed, you've got to know it's there, and you've got to know it needs to go. Which is another way of saying uh, that all the time the law's knocking on different doors in your life and saying, right, now this door of your life, this sin, we've got to start working on that now. But it only happens to the extent we cooperate with the Lord. Therefore, we've got to know and acknowledge and admit if that particular thing about us is true. Now, if we're on our own, if, if it's just a question of us judging ourselves, we deceive ourselves about our sin. You know, we're always going to, you know, turn a blind eye, we're always going to excuse ourselves. But often it's in fellowship that we get often to see ourselves sometimes as other people do. And things that we're blind to of ourselves, that the Lord says, Beresford, look at that about yourself. And I don't even hear his voice, you know. I mean, I'm like, what, what? No, that's not me. See? Turn a blind eye to it. But when other people, lovingly, over a period maybe of years, bring correction to me in that area, then I start to think, well, this, this thing must be true of me because other people who love me and care for me are sharing it with me as well. So the point is, we can only get a true assessment of ourselves in the context of our fellowship and relationships with other people. And that's one of the reasons why you can only get free of the grave clothes in the context of fellowship. Because half the grave clothes we're tied up in, we're blind to, because our hearts are evil and they deceive us. So we need that realism of being in fellowship. And what I want us to do is to just go through various verses in the New Testament, most of them in one John. That, that particular daddy long legs, I think, is beyond any resurrection now, isn't it? Um, and go through various scriptures that just, in the most practical of terms, spell out for us this thing about the importance of being in fellowship, that we live out our relationship individually with the Lord, in the context of our fellowship with other believers. So if you initially find 1 John, the first letter of John, and there are just a little list of things to go through, points that need to be made. Fairly quickly, they're punchy, they're straightforward. This is nitty gritty. And the first thing, is that to say that our love for Jesus is gauged by our love for others. And we're going to be seeing a simple thing here. How do we take our spiritual temperature to find out if we're healthy or not? Well, you take your spiritual temperature by looking at your relationships with other people. And point one, our love for Jesus is gauged by our love for others. So, question. Do you love Jesus? Well, how do you know if you love Jesus? Well, you'll know if you love your brother. Uh, 1 John 4, and uh, we'll read verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, this isn't talking about who is and who isn't a Christian. Because we all know that even as Christians there have been times in our life when we're definitely not loving. What this is saying is that if you are not loving your brother at the moment, then you are not knowing God at the moment. Can you see that's what it's talking about? Your relationship with God at the moment is severed. It's a non-goer if you're not loving your brother. Can you see the point? So that's the test. Verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. That's some tough talk there from the Bible, but that's the truth of it. How do I know if I love God? Well, I know if I love my brother, don't I? And if there's someone I hate, well then I know I definitely don't love God. Do you see what I mean? That's the test. It all boils down our relationship with other people. Uh, find 1 John 3, go back a chapter in verse 16. 
There are some, uh, everyone knows John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's one of the most famous verses in the Bible. But sometimes, skip through the New Testament books and look at all the 3.16s. They're fascinating. And this one is brilliant. 1 John 3.16. And uh, this tells us that our commitment to Jesus is gauged by our commitment to others. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Isn't it easy to say, I'm committed to the Lord? Well, yes, that's very easy to say. But if we're committed to the Lord, we're going to be committed to our brothers and sisters. Um, Jesus laid his life down. for he was, willing, he was willing to suffer for our benefit. Now then, how committed am I to my brothers and sisters? Am I willing to suffer for them? And I, am, you know, am I willing to be inconvenienced for them? Am I willing to put others before myself? If I am, and if I do, then I can say, well, yes, okay, my relationship with Jesus, however imperfectly, at least I'm on the ladder. I'm, you know, I'm on the rungs of the ladder. But if we're not committed to those around us, we're not even on the ladder. Um, go to one John one chapter 1 and verses 6 to 7 um, and this tells us that our fellowship with God is gauged by our fellowship with others 1 John 1 verse 6 if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness I that we're not in right fellowship with other people we lie and do not live by the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Well, I mean, if I'm living in the light with my brothers and sisters, then I'm living in the light with God. But if I'm not living in the light with my brothers and my sisters, then I'm not in right fellowship with God. It's as simple as that. And um, go to Matthew now, Matthew chapter 6. We're seeing our individual relationship with the Lord is worked out in our relationship with our brothers and sisters in fellowship. Well, indeed, not just our brothers and sisters, but our neighbour, those around us, whoever they are. Matthew 6, verse 15, Jesus says, If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So there's a test. Are your sins forgiven? Well, if you're not forgiving other people, they're not. That's the test. Isn't it love this sign forgiven by God? And in the sense that I'm justified and going to heaven, yes. But if I'm saying, am I forgiven in this ongoing day-to-day -day sense, you know, of confessing my sins, am I forgiven? Am I in relationship with the Lord, in fellowship with him? Well, if I'm harboring unforgiveness towards others, I'm not. And when I confess my sins, the Lord isn't listening. All he's wanting me to do is forgive whatever it is I'm holding against whoever it is as well. And so this is the point. Um, I mean, you know, the golden rule, the, the teaching by which Jesus summed up the whole of the Old Testament, he said, love the Lord your God and your neighbour as yourself. So, how do you know if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, etc.? How do you know if you love the Lord your God like that? Well, because you'll love your neighbour as yourself. The one is the evidence of the other. But to claim, I love God, but not to love your neighbour as yourself, is another way of saying you don't love God. That is the test. That's what it boils down to. So the commandments towards God are obeyed by fulfilling the commandments in regards to our neighbour and our brother and sister. So I can gauge my relationship with the Lord, my, where I am individually with the Lord, by looking <coughs> at the quality of my relationships with other people. I can't be held responsible, and neither can you, for people who are in bad relationship with you, and it's not your fault. But it's a question of, insofar as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. That's the point. Insofar as it depends upon me, am I in right relationship with those around me? And uh, I remember some, some years ago, just... Um, up in Suffolk, uh, just uh, you know, sort of like staring at the fire one evening. It's very easy to do when you've got an open fire. And there was this, we had some coal at that point. 
And there was this big bit of coal, and like the fire was was kind of glowing away. And there was this this bit of coal on top, and it just fell out of the fire onto the grate. And as you do, I just sat there and kept looking at it, uh, you know, because fires are fascinating. You just find yourself looking at them. And the longer it was out from among the other coals, it stopped glowing, and the colder, and the blacker, and the dirtier, and the smellier it got. Fundamentally, it went out. And that's the same with you and I. To whatever extent we withdraw from fellowship with our brothers and sisters, we're like lumps of coal. We keep each other burning. But a lump of coal that falls out of the fire, it goes out and it goes cold. And if we're going to keep hot for the Lord, faithful to the Lord, following the Lord, then it is absolutely vital that we remain in fellowship. It's only as those bits of coal all stick together with the fire in common between them that they're going to keep glowing and giving out heat. But if one of them falls out of the fire, it's going to go out. And then what is it? It's just a dirty, smelly, horrible lump of coal. And uh, within the context of me out of fellowship, (coughs) I can't be anything more than an horrible, dirty lump of coal. But if I get into fellowship in the Lord, moving in the Lord with other people in unity and commitment, well then I can be a glow, glowing with the life of Jesus. And it's interesting that in, um, if we just go to, to Romans chapter 12, um, I love this verse, Romans chapter 12, to do a little bit of Greek here, but uh, find verse 11. And um, here it says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Now, in the RSV, it translates that, Be aglow with the Spirit. Be aglow with the Spirit. And that's very much the picture I've just given you of the coal. And the reason that the RSV (coughs) translates it, Be aglow with the Spirit, here, the NIV, where it's got this this word be be fervent, all right, Um, that that, that Greek word, fervor, um, is is the Greek word zeo, which means hot. And the push behind it is is heat. Stay hot for the Lord. I mean, fervent heat. And so that's why the RSV, you know, maybe embellishing it a bit, but draws on this picture of being aglow with the Spirit, like a cut of fire glowing, because it's so hot for the Lord. And that, at the end of the day, is what uh, our fellowship's going to do. If we withdraw from fellowship, if we isolate ourselves, we go cold, we go out. You know, the life of the Lord within us tends to diminish, and we all know it, we've all experienced it. We stay in fellowship, no matter how hard it is sometimes, nevertheless we know from that that we're going to keep being aglow with the Spirit and growing in the Lord. Right, so that's the, um, the, the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 stones, and uh, we'll carry on next time with what happens once they get the other side of the Jordan and uh, set their camp up there. A bit of an eye-watering time, as you'll discover next week. <laughs>